Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the acute medical emergencies, and patients are generally acutely unwell. Let's now discuss the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. We highly recommend that you watch the previous DKA videos to better understand this video. Patients in DKA are acutely unwell, and it is essential to perform a full A2E assessment of patients and establish intravenous access with two wide-bore peripheral cannulas. It's also important to perform the relevant investigations to diagnose the patient's DKA, but importantly, these investigations should not delay treatment. Let's now talk about the key things to manage in a patient with DKA. One of the key problems to manage in DKA is dehydration. Patients in DKA will be very dehydrated due to the severe volume losses due to the severe polyuria. This is why one of the key principles of managing DKA is to give intravenous fluids. Another key problem to manage in DKA is the metabolic acidosis. And if you guys remember from our previous videos, this was due to the ketonemia, as the ketone bodies in the blood generated hydrogen ions and this created a metabolic acidosis. It should then make sense that if you correct the ketonemia, this will help to correct the metabolic acidosis. Patients are also at risk of developing electrolyte disturbances, particularly abnormalities in potassium, like we discussed in the previous video. DKA is characterized by hyperglycemia, and it is important to manage the serum glucose levels. Please note that correcting the hyperglycemia is not as much of a priority as correcting these other complications, as these other complications will likely kill the patient before the hyperglycemia. Finally, another key aspect of managing DKA is managing the initial trigger of the DKA. As if you remember from our previous videos, DKA often has a precipitating cause such as infection or tissue ischemia such as a myocardial infarction. So it is very important to manage these conditions in conjunction with the patient's DKA. There are three key principles to remember for the management of DKA. These include intravenous fluids, insulin, and potassium replacement. Intravenous fluids will help to restore the circulating volume. This is very important as patients in DKA are very dehydrated and have very reduced blood volume. So it's important to restore this circulating blood volume. The intravenous fluids will also help to clear ketones from the blood. And remember, by clearing ketones from the blood, this will help to correct the acidosis as well. Giving intravenous fluids will also help to reduce the stress on the body. If you guys remember from our first video on DKA, DKA is caused by two things, an absolute insulin deficiency in the body and a stress state. The problem with the stress state was that this led to the production of counter-regulatory hormones such as glucagon and cortisol, and these counter-regulatory hormones exacerbated the hyperglycemia in DKA. So by giving intravenous fluids, this will help to reduce the stress on the body by restoring the circulating volume and perfusing the different tissues of the body, and hence this will help to reduce the hyperglycemia. Let's now talk about why insulin is given. Insulin is given for a number of reasons. The most important reason why insulin is given is that it stops lipolysis and hence ketogenesis. If you guys remember from our first video on DKA, insulin is a powerful inhibitor of lipolysis in the adipocytes. So if lipolysis is inhibited, this will mean that the adipocytes will not be producing free fatty acids and there will not be free fatty acids getting taken up by the liver. And hence this will mean that ketone bodies will not be formed. And hence by giving insulin, this will inhibit the formation of ketone bodies, and by inhibiting the formation of ketone bodies, this will help to correct the metabolic acidosis in DKA. So this is the most important reason why insulin is given. Insulin can also go to the liver and inhibit glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis and stop the production of further glucose by the liver. Insulin will also increase glucose uptake from the blood into the peripheral tissues, and this will also help to correct the hyperglycemia by lowering the serum glucose levels. Another reason why insulin is useful is that it will drive potassium into the cells. If you guys remember from our last video, we said that patients in DKA are potassium depleted and the intracellular potassium levels are low. So by giving insulin, insulin will stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase pumps and cause potassium to shift from the blood into the cells. So this will help restore the potassium levels inside the cells. Potassium replacement is very important in DKA because patients in DKA, as we said earlier, have a total body loss of potassium, and the potassium levels inside the cells are very low, so it's important to replace this potassium. Another reason why potassium replacement is given is because when insulin therapy is started, insulin will lower the serum potassium levels by causing potassium to shift from the blood into the cells. Although this will help restore the intracellular potassium levels, the serum potassium levels will start to decrease, and there is a risk of hypokalemia.
so potassium replacement is also given to reduce the risk of the patient developing hypokalemia due to the insulin therapy. Let's now talk about the specific hospital protocol for the management of DKA. Make sure to check your own hospital guidelines. The information in this video has been adapted from the Joint British Diabetes Societies for Inpatient Care's guidelines for the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. Let's start with how intravenous fluids are given. If a patient in DKA presents with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 mm per mercury, then aggressive fluid resuscitation is needed, and this patient will likely need 500 milliliters of normal saline over 10 to 15 minutes, and it's also important to call for senior support in this instance. If the patient's systolic blood pressure is greater than 90 mm per mercury, then there is a well-defined fluid regime that can be initiated for this patient. This is what the fluid regime is. So one liter of normal saline can be given over one hour initially, and then over two hours, and then over two hours, and then over four hours, and then over four hours again, and then finally over six hours. So initially, fluids are given really quickly, and then gradually the speed at which the fluids are given is slowed down. Importantly, after the first bag of fluids, potassium replacement in the form of potassium chloride should be considered added to the fluid bags. And we'll talk later about when to consider adding potassium replacement to the bags of fluids. Let's now talk about insulin. Insulin is usually given as a short-acting insulin, as it's important for insulin's effects to work quickly. Insulin is given as a fixed rate infusion at 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. So for a 70 kg man, that is 7 units per hour. It's very important to continue a patient's long-acting insulin if a patient is usually on one. Insulin will lower the blood glucose levels, and it's important to monitor the glucose levels and make sure that the glucose does not drop too low, as this increases the risk of the patient developing hypoglycemia. And by ensuring that the glucose levels does not drop too low, this can mean that we can continue the fixed rate infusions of insulin so that the insulin can inhibit the production of ketone bodies and resolve the ketoacidosis. So if the glucose drops below 14 millimoles per liter, then 10% glucose can be given alongside the normal saline. Let's now talk about potassium replacement. Before adding potassium replacement to the patient's bags of fluids, it's important to know what the patient's serum potassium levels are. This is why potassium replacement is not usually given in the first bag, as it takes time for the results of the serum potassium levels to come back from the labs. We consider adding potassium replacement after the first bag. If the patient's serum potassium level is greater than 5.5 millimoles per liter, then no potassium replacement is given, as the patient is already hyperkalemic, so giving more potassium would just exacerbate the hyperkalemia. If the patient's serum potassium levels is in the normal range, so between 3.5 and 5.5 millimoles per liter, then 40 millimoles of potassium chloride replacement is given. Just to revise again, even though the serum potassium levels are normal, patients in DKA are potassium depleted, and that's why potassium replacement must be given. And in this instance, 40 millimoles of potassium chloride is replaced. If the serum potassium level is below 3.5 millimoles per liter, then it's important to ask for senior review, as this patient might need invasive potassium replacement, as if the patient continues on fixed rate infusions of insulin, then insulin will continue to decrease the serum potassium levels, and the patient is at risk of developing dangerous hypokalemia. So the patient might need to go to ITU or HDU to receive invasive potassium replacement through a central line whilst also receiving insulin therapy. Patients in DKA are very dehydrated and are at risk of developing clots. So it's important to give venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, and this is often in the form of low molecular weight heparin. If the pH is less than 7, and hence the patient has very severe acidosis, then intravenous bicarbonate can be considered. However, this is a very specialist decision. It's important to manage the initial trigger in conjunction to the patient's DKA, for example, managing the patient's infection or managing the patient's myocardial infarction. Monitoring is also a very important aspect of managing DKA. It's important to regularly monitor the glucose, the ketones, the pH, and the electrolytes of the patient. It's also important to have continuous ECG monitoring of the patient, as the patient is at risk of developing different arrhythmias due to the imbalances of potassium. And it's also important to monitor the patient's fluid balance as the patient is very dehydrated. And it's also important to catheterize the patient if they are not producing urine or they are anuric as the patient might have a very severe acute kidney injury. So this is a summary of the management protocol for DKA. In terms of the metabolic targets for DKA, we aim to decrease the blood glucose levels by at least 3 millimoles per liter per hour until the blood glucose levels reach 14 millimoles per liter at which stage we would consider giving 10% glucose.
we aim to decrease the blood ketones by at least 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour, and we aim to increase the bicarbonate levels by at least 3 millimoles per liter per hour. The fixed rate insulin infusions can be stopped once the blood ketone levels are less than 0.6 millimoles per liter and the pH is greater than 7.3. Once this has happened, the ketoacidosis has been resolved. Once the patient is able to eat and drink, it's important to convert the patient back to their subcutaneous insulin regime. It's also important to refer the patient to a diabetic specialist team. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like on it and subscribe to the channel. We hope you enjoyed the series of videos on DKA and that you found them useful.